we're going to talk about time. Okay, so we're going to think about fMRI data for a while. Dimension, and that one dimension is time. So we're going to take our three-dimensional data set, pick out a single voxel from the brain. Okay, so now we have that one voxel, and we have a measurement of that one voxel from every volume that we took. This is going to be a measure, and this is time. And if the unit of time is every image, then we're going to have a measurement in each voxel from our fMRI signal once every two seconds. Is that clear? So we'll have some measurement, and then two seconds later, some measurement, and two seconds later, and two seconds later. Yes? That's clear to people? So that's every time you go back to this voxel, a measurement of its brightness. Back to in one second what we're measuring. Okay, I'm going to typically draw this as a continuous time series. So I will draw it connected. But you need to remember back in your head, we didn't collect it connected, right? We collected each voxel at specific points in time, separated by the TR, right? Once every two seconds. Okay, what are we measuring? Now we're going to talk about, okay. So this question, what does the bold signal measure? What is fMRI measuring? And how, what is it measure every two seconds that relates to neural activity that happens every three milliseconds? This is, that set of questions is about the hemodynamic response function. So that's what we're going to talk about for a minute. So here's a thing that amazingly happens to be true. This is a voxel in the brain. Let's imagine it's in visual cortex. Voxel and voxel, hundreds of thousands of neurons, right? Voxel's huge. So inside that voxel are hundreds of thousands of neurons and also blood vessels that bring oxygen to those neurons. And the neurons are firing at each other in electrical activity. This, this is basically familiar, right? Neurons send electrical pulses to one another. OK. So if we, for example, we're in the dark, and I suddenly flash bright gratings at you, then on average, the neurons in your visual cortex would fire more than they had been before. And that time scale. neural activity, average neural activity in this whole big giant voxel. If this is when the input comes, so this is time, I turn on a light. Within a few milliseconds, the average firing rate in those neurons will go up. In a few milliseconds, if the light goes back off, it will die down. I flash a light for a few milliseconds, the firing rate a few milliseconds later. Well, actually, if this is, let's get this actually right. This is when I put the onset on. So here's the input. This is visual cortex. This is actually about 100 milliseconds. It has to go into your eyes, hit your retina, go along the optic nerve, get to your thalamus, go through the optic radiation to your visual cortex, and about 100 milliseconds after the light flashed, you'll get an increase of activity in your early visual cortex. OK. So that increase of activity is, in principle, what we're interested in. We're interested in neurons firing. One thing to bear in mind at this point, which is what people say when they criticize MRI research, and this is totally fair, inside a voxel, when you have hundreds of thousands of neurons, are presumably neurons responding to all kinds of different things. So for example, in early visual cortex, some neurons prefer upright lines, some prefer horizontal lines. Those will be mixed in a voxel. Some neurons prefer color, some don't care about color. Those will be mixed. Some are excitatory and some are inhibitory. Those are also going to be mixed, right? So some are input and some are output. We can't tell any of those differences, which are extremely important for understanding the function of a group of neurons. We can't tell the difference between them at all. 
So all we can say is that on average, for those hundreds of thousands of neurons, activity will increase. But what we can't do is unpack how much of that was the excitatory neurons versus the inhibitory neurons, how much was orientation selective versus not orientation selective. We can't see any of that. It's all happening inside the voxel that we're, is the smallest thing we can measure. OK, but still, on average, for a few milliseconds, for maybe 10 or 20 or 30 milliseconds after the information gets to early visual cortex, there'll be an increase in the average firing rate, which will then baseline. OK, now we're going to think about blood, blood oxygen. So here's the input, scale of seconds. So you can't really tell the difference between the input and when the information gets to early visual cortex because 100 milliseconds is very small on the scale. A little, so there the input gets to early visual cortex, and the cells fire a lot, and they use up the local supply of oxygen right, in their metabolism from having fired. So after all that firing, the local oxygen is being used up. Yes? So right around where these cells are firing so hard, the oxygen that was available gets used up in the metabolism of the cells. Now, in principle, if we were going to study blood oxygen as a proxy for neural activity, you would think we would study that, use of the local oxygen as a consequence of the metabolism of neural activity. That, by the way, is called the initial dip. And it exists, but it's small, and it's hard to see because it's so small and so brief. So here's a thing, which is that it turns out the body overcompensates. And the overcompensation, the increase in blood oxygen available locally after a bout of activity is bigger and slower than the initial dip, and peaks about four to six seconds after the activity. This is the explanation of what otherwise would seem like a really weird thing about fMRI, which is that what we study is an increase in oxygen in response to neural activity. That's kind of counterintuitive, right? If you think about metabolism, you think we would study a decrease in oxygen after neural activity, because firing uses the oxygen. And there's a debate about whether there's a reason why the body overcompensates. Is that like accidental? Like, whoops. Um, is it functional? Is it predictive? There have been a whole bunch of debates about why the body overcompensates so that the increase in oxygen after neural activity is so much bigger than the initial dip and almost also so much slower. Um, I'm not aware of whether those debates have been resolved, but it is a fact that the oxygen increases for longer and more than the initial dip. And so that's what we study. We study the increase in oxygen after the activity. One of the things that people wondered was um, how correlated is the blood flow response to the neural activity anyway, right? Like, in principle, it seems possible that blood flow would be quite diffuse compared to neural activity. And so the spatial scale of blood flow might be much lower spatial resolution than the spatial scale of neural activity. That was a thing people wondered. Now, at the moment, since we're at millimeter scale, or much smaller than that, that might not matter. But one thing people wondered is, when would we get to a spatial scale where measuring blood would not be a good proxy for measuring activity? because the blood scale would be too broad. And that certainly there, there's a worthwhile worry there, which is big blood vessels, like giant ones, traveling through a voxel could be going anywhere, right? So if you have a voxel that's on a big, giant blood vessel, that blood is probably going to a whole hemisphere. And so a, a voxel right on a blood vessel could be very misleading about local neural activity. And there's whole phase in my life, and I'm sure other people are still in this phase of their lives, worrying a lot about telling the difference between voxels that are on big blood vessels versus voxels that are on little blood vessels that are plausibly doing local supply. I remember a phase in Nancy's lab where we were doing a lot of work trying to tell the difference between 
blood vessels that could be traveling through and little blood vessels that are probably local. Um, so that is certainly a worry, and I'm sure there are people worrying about it, finding the big blood vessels and trying to take them out of the fMRI signal so that you think you're studying a more local signal. The, but so that's a question. That's one question. But the second question is, okay, ignoring the big blood vessels, what about the little ones? What's the spatial scale at which blood oxygen is delivered compared to oxygen consumed? And so here, not my expertise, but here's a cool thing Morganka's lab published a while ago. Okay, there's a population of astrocytes. And they work like this. So you guys know inside your brain, some of the cells in your brain are neurons, but there's lots and lots and lots of cells in your brain that are not neurons. Inside your brain, many neurons doing information processing, but also many astrocytes doing many other things. So cell types that serve many, many, many other functions in your brain. And one population of those astrocytes, the one whose name is temporarily escaping me, do this super cool thing. So there's an astrocyte cell body near a neuron cell body. And the neuron has a dendrite receiving input and an axon sending output. OK, the astrocyte has a dendrite receiving the same input. It has a foot on the same synapse. But its output is an arm that wraps around a blood vessel. And so it can control the release of blood oxygen to the exact input that the sister neuron is receiving. And Morganka showed that this spatial resolution, at least within the orientation pinwheels in early visual cortex, is one to one. So you could see for each neuron an astrocyte controlling local blood flow exactly in proportion to the input that that neuron was receiving. And you could get exactly the spatial resolution so you can resolve the pinwheels of orientation columns in the astrocytes, just like you could in the neurons, which, if that is a general property of the brain, is wild and crazy and means that blood oxygen flow is being controlled at almost the spatial scale of neural activity. And so in principle, there's no limit, if that's true, to what we could learn about neural activity from blood flow in terms of spatial scale. Surely there are other kinds of limits. But that would mean the spatial scale is, is potentially uh, you know, all the way down. So crazy. The thing about this whole hemodynamic response function is I don't know why it happened. How I feel about this is this is the most convenient gift to cognitive neuroscience. That, right, it's like so helpful. Thank you, brain. Because from my perspective, it didn't have to be this way. I could be wrong. But again, I'm sure I am wrong. But the way that I think about it is it didn't have to be that blood was spatially structured like neural activity. And it didn't have to be that the brain had way more oxygen around immediately after activity than it did before. But thank goodness it did, because it's so much easier to study that way than the tools we had available before we knew about that. How big is that? Uh, what is the scale? Oh, yeah, the, the undershoot is smaller than the peak. It's small, it's small and long. We, this modeling the undershoot correctly is a niche. Um, issue. <laughs> so, um, okay, so I will talk about um, he the hemodynamic response function variability for a second in response to that. Okay, so, so this one that I drew, you can think of as standard. Right, so I just told you it looks about like this. It peaks at around four to six seconds, then there's an undershoot, and then it goes back to baseline. There's a tiny initial dip, right? That's a standard hemodynamic response function. And then you might ask, for any system I'm interested in studying, how sure can I be that it will look like that? Right? And you can think of that in a bunch of ways. Could it be slower? Could it have no undershoot? Right? Could it be higher in some places than others? Could it be fatter in some places than others? Could it depend on which brain region I'm studying or which person I'm studying? Right? OK. So for most cognitive neuroscience research, for most people, for most projects, the way that you will do your research is you will use a standard HRF. And it's, the H it's a model of this shape built into each software package that you might use. So it's a guess about 
in general, on average, what does the hemodynamic response function look like? Often modeled as a difference of gammas for those. Um, but so the, it's just obviously it's a shape that you draw as your best guess of the average. But then, in some cases, people wonder, well, what if that best guess isn't the best? What if there could be a better fit than the average hemodynamic? And so in some parts of the field, it will come up that you're wondering, should I accept the standard HRF, or should I mess with it? Should I think, try to fit something better than that? The most likely case you might be in where you start wondering, Standard HRF is the right way to go, is if you're studying babies or very old people or people with brain damage, right? So you might worry that either in tiny babies or in very old people, for example, that vascular disease in might influence the shape or speed of the HRF. And once you get to those parts of the field, then you'll find that there's a conversation about can we do better than a standard HRF? Should we fit an individual HRF for each person? What do we do about the fact that there might be big deviations from the standard? There's a, um, Alan Jasanoff in our department found that in baby rats, the HRF of tiny baby rats, newborn baby rats, is much slower than of um, adolescent rats. And that created a big brouhaha for people studying humans because he could validate for sure what the HRF was relative to neural activity. We can't measure the neural activity directly, so we have to guess. So then we worried, what is the human, what is, and when is a human comparable to a one-day-old rat? <laughs> the answer to that is probably as a fetus, so you're probably okay. Um, but so these kinds of questions arise at the extremes of populations. For um, Typical people, so for children, for adults, for adults with most conditions, for most brain regions, if you're doing standard analysis, you will probably not be messing with the HRF. You'll probably accept the standard HRF. And furthermore, so this is the thing about this picture. The very strong convention in cognitive neuroscience at the moment, so you can think of this, this is the shape, right? Shape looks like this, it's a difference of gammas, and it has two key parameters that define this shape. The first parameter, this time, right? How long is it from the onset to when it peaks? That's, so the time to peak, that's called alpha. And the second parameter is this one, right? So you can think of any HRF. Once you know that it's approximately this shape, and its alpha parameter and its beta parameter, you pretty much know exactly what shape it is, right? Those two parameters specify the shape. Okay, the very strong convention in cognitive neuroscience is that we fix alpha to a standard value and study only beta. Almost everything you will do in your lives, you will hear people talking about beta. At some point it might occur to you to wonder, beta is the second level letter of the Greek alphabet, where's alpha? And the answer is there's alpha. Alpha is the time to peak or the delay of the HRF. And for almost all purposes, that is fixed at a standard value, usually around five seconds. So it, in fMRI, for each individual, we measure, for each individual voxel in each experiment, for each condition, we measure beta. Fix everything else. Yeah. So this is what I was just, just trying to say, is that the convention for almost everything we ever do is that we expect that based on prior expectations that when there is neural activity, there will be an HRF, it will have this shape, and it will have a fixed alpha. And we use all of those assumptions to let us solve for one variable, beta. So that's what we're going to come to building a GLM to solve for beta. But, but the critical thing to bear in mind is that we can solve for that one variable by fixing, based on prior assumptions, everything else about the shape of the hemodynamic response. Yeah, this is a measurement. This is not a measurement. Yeah. Yeah. So, so one thing that might have got confusing is I went from data here to a model here. This is not data yet. 
right? This is our assumption. So this is one of the things I was trying to make clear is here what we're talking about is the assumptions we use in order to be able to analyze fMRI data. Everything inside here is assumptions. It's prior knowledge that we bring to data analysis. Right. So as I said, almost all neuroscience research, the cognitive neuroscience research that you will see, not all, but almost all, doesn't study alpha. So I know, of, so for example, beta, we know about how it habituates and all kinds of things, which we'll come to. But very little research studying alpha, except in extreme populations. So, so looking at the effects in infancy and old age, then people get really interested in delay to peak. But I know of almost no research studying alpha. Does anybody here know of people who are studying? I mean, I know of a few cases where people are trying to resolve tiny differences in onset time based on fitting the HRF really, really, really well. But that's different from alpha. Right, so that's trying to use a really good fit to tell the difference between, for example, 100 milliseconds different. People do do that. Yeah. So if you collect enough data, HRF really, really, really well, then you can get quite precise about whether it's better fit by an onset 100 milliseconds. And that lets you tell the difference. David Heger gave a talk here a long time ago, like five, ten years ago, that blew me away. They collected 12 hours of data on the world's most boring ta task, two conditions almost identical, like really exceedingly dull. And, but because they had measured the HRF so many times and at every possible temporal increment, they could tell the difference between V1 and V2 in terms of the timing. They could tell a, a, a hundred millisecond difference. So I guess it wasn't V1 V2 in a forward path. But in any case, it was a hundred millisecond difference. They resolved it with fMRI by measuring the heck out of the HRF and thus being able to tell the difference between one that started just a little bit later. That was cool. But not usually that useful. So one question you might ask is, should we have a different alpha for different cortical regions, right? And certainly because the time of the input to the time of the peak is very plausibly different, you know, it, during the bottom-up suite, there's milliseconds of difference as the information travels through different brain regions, for example. Um, and for lots of other reasons, you might think different brain regions could respond with different temporal delays. In standard task-driven data analysis, people almost never try to resolve the temporal difference. They just try to fit an amplitude difference holding the time constant. There, so when you get to like effective connectivity, for example, which we might talk about later, then people start trying to think about time. But for standard task-based analyses, standard analysis, almost all of it, people fix alpha and study beta. And I mean, the reason, so this, when you say it this way, it sounds crazy, right? Like, how could we assume the same temporal delay for something that we know doesn't have the same temporal delay? But the answer is that um, variability in alpha is probably pretty small for confidence in estimating it, whereas variability in beta is big relative to our confidence in estimating it. And so, so basically, for most standard experiments, standard data, probably this is the right. Not that people are crazy. Yeah. The, the basic intuition here is, is just that for the normal case, the differences in alpha are small, probably, compared to the differences in beta. Because of that, basically, it's more sensitive to measure beta than alpha. Yeah. OK, but so that's, so this comes back to answering Samuel's question about why the two second resolution. Why do we use approximately a two second resolution? And the answer is because that's about twice the speed of the HRF. And that lets us measure the, of the peak of the HRF. If what we're trying to estimate is the peak of the HRF, then measuring at twice that speed gives us a decent shot that we measured at some point near, so across multiple measurements, we usually have a couple of measurements around the top of the HRF. So for people familiar with this, this is the Nyquist frequency analysis, right? You have to be twice as fast as anything you want to resolve. So two seconds is fast enough that we can resolve the HRF. And anything slower than that, you spend 
where you wouldn't be able to see it. Right? And so, for example, at a five second TR, you could miss an entire HRF, which is the thing you're often trying to study. And so, for task driven MRI, usually two seconds is as slow as people want to go, and that sets the spatial resolution that they can achieve. There are exceptions where people go slower. For example, in resting state scans, sometimes people go slower. That's a whole separate conversation about why that's OK. But for the most part, if we're trying to measure the HRF in response to an input, then we need to be measuring it about faster. People do sometimes try to go faster, like every one second. But then often the sacrifice in terms of spatial resolution or coverage is too much. So for current experiments, for the standard vanilla EPI experiment that you would do, often the trade-off is a one and a half or two second TR, and then as much spatial resolution and coverage as you can get in that time. So that is the model. And now we have to talk about how you use it to analyze data. So, so far we've talked just about went off on all of this is so that this is real blood oxygen. What we measure in fMRI is a blood oxygen level dependent signal. And so the brightness of each voxel is related to the oxygen that's present. We're not actually measuring oxygen, um, but we're measuring a proxy of oxygen related to how water molecules respond to magnetic gradients, which is close enough to think about the bold signal when it goes up, there's more oxygen present. The reason there's more oxygen present is the HRF response. And so that what we're now going to do is use what we know about the HRF response to take what we measured in the bold signal and to try to make inferences about neural activity, which is what we're, we're actually interested in. Just going to give a little more terminology. This is called the hemodynamic lag. That is the time from the actual input to the peak response. So sometimes you'll hear people say they did their analysis accounting for the hemodynamic lag, and then that means that they, when they did the stimulus over here, they were expecting a response. Right? They did the stimulus at time zero, they expected the response five seconds later. That's accounting for the hemodynamic lag. Okay, and then as I said, data characterizes the amplitude is the thing that we're mostly going to be. So going back to data, now we have what we know about the bold signal. And we have what we measured. And we're going to try to combine them to make inferences about neural activity. OK, and so this is the simplest conceptual introduction to a GLM, general linear model, of fMRI data. So here the idea is we measured activity over time. We measured blood oxygen over time in this one voxel. We know if there was neural activity, what the HRF would have looked like. right? And so what we say is, OK, look, in our experiment, this is what happened over time in my experiment. There was something I was interested in. It's a face for now. And so this is time, right, on the x-axis. And I put a face on the screen at two particular times. I know when I put them on, and I know when I put them off, right? So this is what I know about what I did on my computer. When the box goes up, I put a face on. When it goes back down to zero, there's no face on the screen anymore. That's, that's the model of my experiment. When was there a face on the screen? Got that so far? OK, so this is the first thing you need to know in any MRI analysis, is your experimental design. What do you do what? So I, there's time, and I put a face on, and then I turned it off. And I also know, because you're not allowed to sit at the back, I'm sorry, only in front of the backward facing seats. You're otherwise welcome. Um, OK, so I put, I put the face on the screen at the time. I also know if. The, and if a voxel contained neurons that responded to those to that face, that on average there was a bunch of neural activity, I know what I expect, which is uh, those neurons on average fired, right? And so what I expect then is that after they did all that firing, there was an initial dip in the oxygen, followed by 
increase and then the undershoot, right? So that's what probably would have happened if, on average, the neurons in that voxel fired a bunch in response to that face. And if they like faces, every time there's a face, right? Now if, for example, my other condition, that's when I put the scenes on the screen. Okay, let's say we're imagining an FFA voxel, so this voxel really doesn't care about scenes at all. Then I have a prediction for those too, which is that when I put the scene on the screen, nothing particular happens to the average neural activity, which means that nothing particular happens to the blood oxygen either. Okay, so those are my predictions for a voxel that I'm going to think of as a face-selective voxel in this experiment. Right? Those are just examples. That's what I predict for any voxel where the average of the neurons in that voxel really like responding to A and really don't like responding to B. Does that make sense as a prediction? OK. So the way that we test that hypothesis, first of all, we say, OK, this is what my prediction looks like. That's based on the shape of the average HRF. So this blue line is my prediction for what will happen based on the two things I know, when I put my condition on the screen and the shape of the HRF. Okay? So when I put my conditions on the screen, that's usually called a boxcar regressor. This is not the only way to do it, but this is the simplest way to do it. Where you see, it's a, called a boxcar because you can see it looks like the boxcars of a train, right? It's just up or down. So on whenever it's on, off whenever it's on. Convolved with an HRF, right? So multiplied by the shape of my expectation for an HRF. And that's usually the standard thing I put in a model. So I say that's what I would expect of a voxel if the neurons in it, on average, fire a lot in response to condition A, OK? Then what I do, I take that shape, and I line it up to my actual data, right? And I told you I'm going to fix everything except for one parameter that I'm going to solve for, right? So I'm going to figure out if I have this prediction up to these data, what is the beta value? that explains the most variance in these data, right? That fits the measured data the best. So it's going to be, so this is my way of adjusting this amplitude of the whole regressor shape. So I find the beta value such that anything I do going up or down data better. Does that make sense as a way of thinking about it? That's a spatial way to think about what you're doing when you fit a GLM. There is a good question, which is, Here I had two trials cases. Why did I fit one beta, not two betas, right? And so the, the answer to that is in a bunch of stuff about GLMs that we can go down. But in general, all things being equal, you get more stable fits for um, runs long enough that so where you can separate your design from the, from the scale of the noise. So I will just give you heuristic now. We can talk about it more later. But in general, this works better if you're modeling about five minutes of fMRI data with at least four trials per condition. That's approximately a good metric. And again, we can go into deep details about why. Um, but you will get a more stable beta fit when the temporal frequency of your model is most different from the temporal frequency of the about, which includes low frequency. Um, so, Let's go in more detail into that into into that later, because that's a complicated GLMs and I'm trying to do simple GLMs. But so yes, for this purpose, I'm fitting one beta value for the whole regressor, right? And so in this case, I built a regressor with two trials. So what I have to do is find the single amplitude that fits the data the best across the average of those two trials, right? Okay. Some people prefer to think about this fit in this way, and other people find it more intuitive to think about it a different way. Okay, So a different way to think about what you're doing here is that you have all the time points that you measured, right? 
measured a whole bunch of time points. And your beta value predicts a value at every time point, right? You can think of this as being the line that best makes the predicted value fit the measured value. That's the same, that's a, a different way of thinking about exactly the same operation, right? You're trying to make the predicted value as close as possible to the measured value for all the points you measured over time. You, the beta value that you get for this voxel is the beta value of the amplitude such that it explains the all the data as best as it can. Now, one thing to bear in mind is at lots of time points in the run, a given beta value is at zero, right? So it's only trying to explain data when it's not at zero. Does that make, is that clear? So if you look, for example, this regressor, the pink one, now we're going to fit the beta value for this one. So that starts here. So the best fit to the data that matches the data I drew of the pink regressor is a slightly negative beta over the course of this whole run. That's trying to fit our slightly negative each time. Right now I'm doing simple, simple, simple GLMs. So um, block designs or very slow event related designs. Such, so the key one thing that I, I drew here is that the response to condition A and the response to condition B are very separate in time. That makes it simpler to find them and to separate them from one another. Um, and A goes on and off and then on and off, right? There are multiple different levels of A. So this kind of experimental design where you have only two conditions and slow, they're very separate in time and you measure them enough times, those kinds of experiments are pretty robust. And so actually now we're often used as quote unquote localizers. They're just, they're so easy to run and so easy to analyze. They're not sensitive to a lot of, not particularly sensitive to a lot of parameters. Um, as I said, the analysis, you can, the fitting the HRF and what you could do differently than having a standard HRF, Again, we could do a whole talk on other ways to model it, data and time. Um, the most relevant alternative to what I'm talking about is called finite impulse response modeling, and that's a whole long thing that we could talk about. So I'm giving vanilla, vanilla versions. The space of more complicated versions is large and out there, and so you can spend as much time as you want talking about more complicated models, more complicated experimental designs and more complicated models and more complicated models, then it works less and less well, and we have less and less confidence how well it's working. Yeah, so I'm starting with this kind of thing because it's standard procedure, and for this kind of, for, for the most simple models, this is very robust. Um, and so it helps to have the simple case in mind before approaching a more complicated case. So here, I modeled it as if it basically is irrelevant, right? So Layla's asking, look, when I did it over here, I said the input goes on and off, and the time scale is all about the HRF. But Layla's saying, well, what about if this lasts longer? Well, then how do we think about what that does to the timing of the HRF? Okay, so the most standard thing to do in a block design right, is convolution, which essentially makes your model look like this. People have wondered if that's actually the right thing to do for lots of reasons, um, including, uh, like Veronica asked, should we expect habituation over time, right? So neurons habituate over time. When you put a new, throw a new thing at a neuron, there's a big peak, and then it decreases, and there's a lower maintained firing rate, even in response to a stimulus it really likes. You might expect to find the same thing in MRI. In fact, you do find, right? So actually, what this would look like is a higher response at the beginning and suppressed response or habituated response as you go along. Um, again, for vanilla cases, people don't worry about that. The most simple thing to do if your block lasts longer is effectively just to make the time at peak last longer in your model. But that's not the only option. There are other options, and we could certainly talk about what they are. Yeah. But that's the standard option. So the beta value is the amplitude that best fits the That could be positive. It could be negative. Right. But then you said yeah, so the, the, 
The task, the fa like faces, faces are on at some points, and then there's a long period of time when there's no faces on, which means that the predicted value of the regression is zero. And basically, those points don't contribute to the fit. Okay. So when you build a regressor, you're making predictions for the times you're making predictions for, but there can be long periods of the time when this regressor doesn't make any predictions, right? And so basically you can think of like all these non-zero time points, those are the ones that you're trying to fit your beta to. Does that make sense? Yeah. The, yeah, the time points when your regressor is at zero don't contribute to the fit of those. Yeah. So, and then if you build in this model, right, this model will fit the other. No, one model for both, for all the conditions. Yeah, so a single GLM will, con will contain multiple different regressors. And um, the ideal GLM contains regressors for everything you know about because you're trying to fit all the variance in the time course to the best of your ability. Um, so, right. But so for the current purposes, I'm thinking of one run of data, two conditions, so two regressors. Not exactly true that these don't contribute to the fit, but, it, but I'm trying to keep it simple for the moment. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. Some people, some people find this way of thinking about it more clear, right? And the beta is the slope of the fit. Yeah. So it's the amplitude in, the, in this space. It's the slope in this space. Yeah. So this is a time series for a standard oversimplified experiment. Right. Um, I wasn't going to go into a more complicated experiment yet. No, no, no. Oh, like real data? Yeah. No, no, I wasn't going to show real data. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is all fake data. Yeah. There a lot, a lot, a lot of variability. Yeah, so this is, this is very oversimplified, for sure. Um, so if you want to think about, yeah, so, so this actually gets a little bit to the question Melissa was asking. Like, how many times do you need to measure an HRF before you have anything like a sense of how big it is compared to how much other conditions or other data do you need? Um, so, right, a rough estimate is you probably need a bare minimum of four times for the biggest difference, for the simplest thing that we understand the best. If you have really good data, in our lab we get away with um, five times per condition if we need to. So for a thing that we understand really well that has a massive response and a block design that's efficiently constructed, the bare minimum we would use is five times, five, five repetitions per condition. That would be Type thing. That's right. Yeah. Oh, and somebody at some point asked me, what's the scale? And the scale of the blood oxygen response, oh, um, so the, there's a whole bunch of things about units in fMRI analysis. One way to think about this is it for a voxel as a percent of its resting baseline. So that you, if you work in Nancy's lab, you will hear this described in terms of percent signal change. So that says we take, some, we take a voxel, we take whatever its average bold signal is like when we're not asking you to do anything in particular, and then relative to that, we ask how much more blood oxygen level dependent signal is there in response to my provocation, right? If that's the scale you're used to thinking on, then big, like really big, is around 1 to 2%. That's a big MRI response. Okay. So thinking about how big are these signals that we are measuring. Um, so yeah, bullseye on V1, retinotopic mapping, 1 to 2% signal change um, is one way of thinking about it, and lots of noise. Yeah. Um, anything more complicated than that, you're going to have. That's how big the true signal is. But one thing that we get out of this is a number, which is what is the beta value, right? What is the amplitude at which? this fits the best, right? And that is also a number, but it's a arbitrary units, right? It's a number that comes out of a regression. It's a scaled value. And so people often report, actually bold is as if it were a real scale, they report this often in arbitrary units. As AU, that's arbitrary units.
It means they set some scale on their regression, literally arbitrary units, and then they give you the beta value relative to the scale they set, but we don't know what that scale is with respect to anything you could measure in the outside world. Again, there was a while when that caused much consternation. I don't know if Nancy's still on this, but there was a while when it drove her absolutely bananas that people published their data where their y-axis was arbitrary units. Because if they're arbitrary units, you can't compare anything to anything because you don't know how they set the scale. And it depends on the regression and the number of, of other regressors and the details of how to build it, what arbitrary units are. Yes. So, well, okay, so what Dave just said is, isn't percent signal change also arbitrary? It is not also arbitrary, but it is also highly variable. So the percent signal change is, first of all, relative to the resting bold signal per voxel, which is very variable across people, scanners, head coils, et cetera, et cetera. And so the question is, is it any better to do it in percent signal change? Is that any more reliable across people? In my experience, it is more reliable. It's a scale. But it's not perfectly reliable. Like so, so Dave's saying, is it better to just be honest that there's no way to compare data from one experiment to another, rather than try to have a scale in which you could compare? The thing is that in a sequence of experiments that were done in similar ways on a similar scanner, it was comparable. So you could compare, in Nancy's data in a paper, you could compare from person to person, from experiment to experiment. She did get fairly stable things within a scanner, within an experimental paradigm. And it w did let us tell the difference. So that, this happened to me too, right? I did experiments where I got significant results with a 0.2% signal change, and other ones where I got significant results with a 1.8% signal change. And I was like, I wonder if that's a real thing. And I did it again in the same person at the same time, and it was exactly true. So it, Percent signal change can give you meaningful answers that are replicable, whereas arbitrary units can't. I think, that, I think it's less of a religion around you now. Does anybody know? Is Nancy still on the percent signal change religion, or has she accepted betas as a currency? She accepts betas? OK. That's right. So Melissa just said, what about the fact that the resting um, blood oxygen or resting activity from one region to another is different, which it certainly is. There are different resting metabolisms in different brain regions. What those mean is that that was one of the potential topics that I could talk about. What does it mean that there are brain regions with really high resting metabolisms? So this is a question. And the, so, so again, just to reiterate, the question is, well, what if you found that one brain region had a 1.5% signal change and another brain region had a 0.2% signal change? Does that mean that they respond differently to your stimulus or they respond differently at rest, right? So those are perfectly valid questions. The argument of the old signal change religion was, wouldn't you rather know you had that question than not know that you had that question, since it's an interesting question. And you only know you have that question if you display your data in comparable ways. So in any case, Again, I, I think that many of the people who are very adamant about percent signal change have let it go. Um, I have let it go. Um, we do lots of stuff. Although, frankly, I still prefer percent signal change when it comes down to it. And I prefer showing the HRF, not just the beta. But anyway, just so, so back to what we're doing. We're fitting the shape. We're getting a best fit amplitude. That amplitude value scaled to the regression, rest in arbitrary units. That's the amplitude of the, of the regressor fit to each condition in one voxel. So, but in general, there, there was also a question of do these signals add linearly or multiplicatively, right? There's a lot of questions about whether percent signal change is the best way to represent it. OK, we can come back to statistics in a second. We haven't done any statistics. No, definitely not everybody reports this everything in the same way. For all x, if the question is, is it standardized, the answer is no. Um, and so different people will report it in different ways. But so far, we're not at anything you can report. So, so again, hold thoughts about statistics and reporting, because we're not even close. Yeah. So far, all we're trying to do is fit two regressors in one voxel. Right? OK, so let's come back to where we're at and then try to this is the risk of the experts. Try to go back to where we're, we are, and then we'll go, get to the more complicated stuff. OK, so where we're at, we have the green line. The green line is the time course in one voxel, right? Drawn continuously, but actually measured in two second increments, right? Everybody's with me again? I want everybody back on the same page. OK, so 
We measured blood oxygen signal in one volume over time. At two second increments, we measured its blood oxygen signal in one voxel. We represent that as a time course. And then we try to fit the regressors, which are a combination of when we knew we did our experiment and the shape of the HRF that we expected. And because of our expectation about the HRF, we want to infer that if there was a bigger HRF, a higher amplitude HRF, that there was more neural activity at the time of the stimulus. Right? If there's a small HRF or a negative HRF, that's because there was less neural activity at the time of the stimulus. So basically, the model lets us work backwards from the time course of what we measured in the HRF to what we're interested in, the size of the neural response at the time of the stimulus. Yeah? Ah, that is a great question and relates also to what Melissa and Stefano were just talking about. What does a negative beta mean? Yeah. And so, again, there was a controversy about that. But the literal interpretation has to be that the stimulus was not on. The hemodynamic activity in that voxel was on average higher than when you turned it on. So somehow when you turned on that stimulus, the average blood oxygen, and we infer therefore the average neural activity, went down, not up. What people worried about is, is that really neural activity going down? Or is this something to do with the distribution of oxygen but not neural activity? So that was a hypothesis people worried about for a while, that maybe there's a more limited supply of oxygen. And so if you're sending oxygen to region A, region B has to lose oxygen, even though it's not actually decreasing its neural activity. I don't know if somebody has resolved that, but the assumption in the field seems to be now we should treat it as actually decreasing activity. So people, when they see a negative bold signal, infer that when you put that stimulus on, the average neural activity in that voxel temporarily went down, leading to a decrease in the oxygen consumption. Yeah, that is how people interpret it. OK, so for this voxel, based on the amplitude of the best fit beta, we get a number, which is the, that, so rather, based on the fit of the HRF, we get a single number, the amplitude of the beta when the fit was the best, for each of our regressors. Yeah? Per voxel. Um, great. So um, one question is, what is this relative to? So this is where I was saying zero doesn't go into the model. That's not exactly true. Right? It's relative to the, it's relative to the unmodeled <coughs> times. Right? So it's relative to zero. Um, what is zero? Really? So in this model, um, you don't explicitly try to model zero, right? So you model the whole run, and you model deflections from that whole time course. And so effectively, the technically it's the intercept, right? It's the intercept of this, um, but it's unmodeled <coughs> per, per run. So you Whatever is the, the unmodeled, basically, average of the run, you're modeling relative to that. Does that make sense? I can try to explain it in more detail if that makes sense. But basically, you can think, OK, you, you start with effectively the mean of the run, or the unmodeled data of the run, gets taken out of this whole model. And what you're looking at is the slope. That, does that help enough? Yeah. OK, good. So anything that's true of an entire run, you want to model out of your data. And you're looking at deflections within the run. This back to Melissa's question about how many betas do you model in an experiment. If you are building a model of an experiment that has multiple runs, um, then you definitely need to account for the difference in the average, um, the average time course, the average value of the whole time course per run. And so any model that has multiple runs will which is the average per run, to take that out. So that what you're looking at is deflections from the average of the run. I can, again, get into that more later. But so this is relative to the unmodeled average of the run. Any differences between runs you want to take out separately, deflections within the run. Okay. <clears throat> 
So we have one time course that came from one voxel from which we got two beta values, right? Clear? OK, so now what you can think of this as having done well, let us infer the amount of neural activity in each voxel based on the time course of the bold response. But it also lets us lapse time, right? We measured four-dimensional data. Now we can go back to three-dimensional data, where based on this, in, our data, in the three dimensions of the brain, we can take each beta value that we measured and put it back in the voxel where we measured it, right? So let's say this is one arbitrary unit, right? So now we can say, OK, the beta value here for that condition was 1. Yeah? And since we do this once per voxel, we fit a beta for every voxel separately, then in every voxel in the brain, we now have a beta value for this condition, right? So this is now a volume. This is a three-dimensional volume, which is an image of the brain, where at each position, the value you have now is the value of the beta you measured in that voxel. Since we had two models, we will have two beta images. So whereas when we collected the data, we had four-dimensional data, right, and a whole, an image of the brain every time we collected it, now we have three-dimensional data twice. go from runs and runs of images and images and images and images, you compress that down to two images, the beta value at each position. Yeah, so right now we have a beta value for each individual voxel. And there's many things you can do with those, including getting average values for regions that are bigger than voxels. But we haven't done any of that. So for now, each voxel has its own beta value, one per condition. Yeah. And then we will combine them later in various different ways. But for now, it's, this is important because this, these images are going to be the raw stuff of all the analyses we do from now on. So everything we do after this, we're going to start with beta values per voxel. And then we'll do many different operations to them. Okay. So the, this is a key point for beginners to wonder whether or not you are following. Because again, for the key question that, that like Veronica asked, what happens to my data before somebody hands it to me? This is a stage at which you might be handed data, right? Where you have a beta value, a beta image. And one thing I'd like you to have is a sense of what is a beta image. Like for example, how many beta images should I expect to have, right? If you have in your folder as many beta images as you expected, you kind of have a sense on. If there's more or less than you expected, you should wonder, what are those other beta images, right? This is a good reality check point for your, for your basic understanding of fMRI analysis, is to have as many beta images as you expected. That's a great question. This is a perfect comprehension question. So the green was the time data that we collected, right? That could be 25 minutes, right? So that's 25 different, so if it's 25 minutes, shoot, I can't multiply. 25 times 60 divided by 2. So we had 7,500 images of the brain, right? Where did they go, right? So if you fit them all with a single model, right, then you fit beta for every time your condition occurred, right? Fit it. After you fit it, you have one amplitude, which was the number at which it best fit your data. And all you have left in a beta image is that one number, just the amplitude. If you literally only had betas, all you would know is the amplitude of the best fit. Anything about how well it fit, anything about time, alpha, if you wondered about alpha, that's all gone. Right? All you know is what was the amplitude of the best fit of the HRF. And that's where time went. It all disappeared into the fit of the beta. Clear? OK, sometimes when we build models, if we collected the data in runs, so if a person did this experiment for five minutes, then you give them a break, then they did it for five minutes, and then you give them a break, and then they did it for five minutes, and then they give them a break, there are two different standards for how you should model that. 
In one standard, you model a beta per condition per run. And in another standard, you first concatenate all the data and model a single beta for the entire experiment. Those are two different ways of handling it. So you might expect to have as many betas as you have conditions. Or you might expect to have as many betas as you have conditions times the number of runs. If you modeled just one trial, right? So let's say we made a regressor that looked like this. That's the box card. Now I'm going to evolve it so it looks like this, right? And then I fit it. So now I'm going to fit it. And it looks like this, right? Okay. So if that was my best fit beta, because I only did one trial, it will be pretty darn close to whatever the magnitude was on that trial. But the beta still has a shape, right? Whereas the data don't necessarily have that shape, because the data are corrupted by tons of noise. And so the beta probably won't exactly match the data if you fit it to one trial, but it will be a lot closer than if you have to fit it to many. Is that clear? Um, yeah, so the, this was the question that Melissa was asking is there's a trade-off in terms of how stable the beta is. Um, so right, it will explain a lot more variance if you fit it to only one trial, but of course that means it's explaining a lot more noise. And um, so there is tons of noise in fMRI data from many different sources, um, and so the most uh, robust fits come when you're, the frequency of your prediction is different from the frequency of the noise. So both when your prediction is faster than the slow noise and slower than the fast noise. Um, so again, like if you want to know what does that work out to in practice, in practice the highest power experimental designs have blocks that last between 16 and 24 seconds and that repeat at least four times within a five-minute run. That's the frequency at which you get the most robust measures of the HRF. So that's the typical frequencies at which localizer experiments happen. Because at that frequency, your that temporal frequency of measurement happens to be far away from the noise I experiments. Um, yeah. And if you measure less than four trials per run, or your blocks are faster or closer together, then the signal, the frequency of your signal gets closer to the frequency of the noise. SNR goes down. So many, this is a dispute right now in MVPA. Should you be single trials as the unit of your analysis for MVPA? Because single trials are really noisy measures, and we know they're really noisy measures. Um, so in my lab, we also use single trials as the thing we classify. The result is our classification accuracies are very low, right? Like 53%. They're significant, but very low because the thing we're classifying is very noisy. In other labs, it's standard practice to average a ton more trials and then use that as the thing you classify. Like Galan's lab averages at least seven trials before they try to predict anything. Um, so the same intuitions that make the beta fit more stable if you fit more trials make the unit of analysis in MVPA more stable and less noisy if you first average across more trials. And then there's a philosophical issue about, well, what did you classifying and stuff? Yeah. Yeah. But single trial fMRI data, crazy noisy. Definitely true. But yeah, the technical term run in fMRI analysis is dispute. All terms in fMRI have different meanings for different people. When I say run, I mean the time that the scanner was running continuously until you stopped it to take a break. Even if the break was two seconds. If you stopped it and then you started again, that will be saved as a different DICOM and then usually unpacked into a different bold directory. And so that is the unit that then fMRI analysis is usually done over, but not always. So sometimes people then put them back, concatenate them back to a long data set. But, but most fMRI analysis that I know of operates on the unit of the run, which is I ran the scanner for a while, then if you stopped and you started again, for example, the scanner reshims, and so you, that is the start of a new run. So that's usually the, the unit of analysis, and you fit regressors for each run. Right. So this is why I keep going back and forth. Some labs 
analyzed by runs. Some labs concatenate first and analyze. Awesome. I love that you guys are asking questions. Yes, these are three-dimensional images where for every voxel there's a beta value. And the difference between the two is that in this one, at each position, you have the beta value for this regressor. And in this one, at each position, you have the beta value for this regressor. Right? So every voxel in the brain, right? this whole procedure that I showed you where you take that voxel's time course and then you fit the regressors for your conditions to that time course and you find the amplitude of the best fit for each regressor. You do that for each voxel independently. And so now for every voxel, you have a beta value, an amplitude for this regressor and an amplitude for this regressor and one for as many regressors as you had in that model, right? And so then had this, right, for every voxel, as many regressors as you had in your model. And that's time, right, modeled over time in terms of regressors. And then, so that compresses back into one value per regressor. And then we turn those into one volume per regressor. Yeah. And the question of exactly what are those voxels, how big are they? The simplest thing to think about is that they're the voxels of the images you collected. That's probably not true. So we'll come to what the voxels probably really are. But the simplest thing to think about is if you analyzed your data as you collected them, then a voxel would be a 3 by 3 by 3 chunk of brain as you, right? So if the head stayed perfectly still and never moved during your experiment, then this time course is the time course you measured in one voxel. And then these beta values are the beta values that correspond to the voxels that you measured. That's an idealization. Right, how do you decide which regressors to model? So the minimum is you model every condition you're interested in, right? The point of this whole endeavor is to figure out how much neural activity there was in response to your conditions in each position. That's why we do fMRI is to study neural activity and response, or task-based fMRI, right? To study neural activity in response to conditions. So at a bare minimum, whatever you had people do, that's what you model. Then, there's a bunch of other things you might model in addition, sometimes called nuisance regressors. And so we can talk about what you might also model in addition to what you're interested in. But the bare minimum is you model what you're interested in. And so if your experiment was, I'm interested in the brain regions involved when people think about other people's thoughts compared to the brain regions involved when they think about other logically complicated tasks then you would have people think about other people's thoughts sometimes, and that's one regressor, and think about other logically complicated things at a different time, and that's the other regressor. And then you'd solve for the amplitude of those two regressors, and then you'd have two beta images. OK, so Veronica's question is, let's say somebody gave you a beta image. What kind of numbers would you expect to see in that beta image? And the answer is that um, there's no way of knowing that because it depends on a lot of things, right? So first of all, what kind of beta numbers you will get? As I said, betas are in arbitrary units, which are relative to the rest of the regression. So the first thing is you don't know how the regression was scaled, and you don't know what the, how, you don't know anything. If you just, somebody gave you a beta image, you don't know anything about the scale of that regression. So that's the first thing. The second thing is how stable the betas are and therefore what their dynamic range is, will depend on how many trials they fit, right? So this is something we were just talking about. If you built one beta for each trial, then they're going to be very noisy, which means their dynamic range is going to be very large. You'll have some enormous values and some tiny values and some extremely negative values because you're fitting mostly noise and the no range of the noise is large, right? Whereas if you built one beta for an experiment that had, say, 20 trials in that condition, then the values of the betas will be more stable, and so they won't have as big a range. So if somebody hands you a beta image and doesn't tell you how they produced it, you're in big trouble trying to figure out whether those are good data or bad data. Also, when you fit, once you have a beta value, you don't know how well it fit the data. You don't know anything about the noise. All you got was the amplitude. And so this is part of why I want you to know where beta images came from in your own data, is that if all you have is a beta image, you actually don't know anything about what kind of values you should expect, what kind of values are reasonable, when is it super noisy, that's very hard to tell. Yeah. 
Should we try to do anything about noise values? So I drew this picture, my green data collection picture, and, and we said these are idealized data in a number of ways, right? I'm underestimating the noise for sure, and I'm assuming that the person lay perfectly still, and so when you collected their data, the voxel was on exactly the same part of brain for the entire hour and a half, right? All of those assumptions are certainly false, and more false, the, for example, the more you're studying children or autism or whatever, right? Okay, so I haven't told you anything about how to handle noise in these data or motion or artifacts or anything. Um, and that topic is a big whole topic. Um, in fact, it's many topics. I listed it as five topics of how to do preprocessing. So I will answer just the narrow question you asked, but bear in mind this is in a big context, um, which if we get to it, we can do a whole half day on preprocessing tomorrow, depending on what we decide. Preprocessing was like fourth in the list of preferences on the survey, so I don't know if we're going to get to all of it. Okay, but the simplest um, thing is there's one simple kind of noise that is not uncommon, and it can occur for a number of reasons, but one reason is like imagine you participant sneezed. Okay, so while they were sneezing, their head was moving a ton, but before and afterwards they were still. Okay, so while their head was moving, at every voxel in the brain, there's going to be tons of noise. And often what that will look like is a giant spike as you're moving through the acquisition. This can also happen sometimes from scanner noise. Something can happen in the scanner that can make the whole image go simultaneously bright. So if one image the whole brain goes really bright, and then you go back to normal, then people talk about that sometimes as an artifact. I mean, the word artifact has many meanings, but that's one of the possible meanings, or a spike, right? And if you fit a beta for a condition that has a giant spike in it, you'll get totally the wrong answer, right? So if you look at the time course I drew, right, if we're trying to fit this, this um, pink beta value, and the data actually look like that, then we have to get the best fit to all of these data points, but also, let's move it right in. So the, the amplitude that best fits all of the data you collected is now kind of like here, right? Even though actually this shape doesn't look anything like the data. Is that clear? Because you're trying to compensate for the fact that this point is way out there. And so even though the, all the rest of the data is kind of down here, this one point brings the amplitude of the best fit way away from what the actual best fit should be. Is that clear to people? And so this is one kind of noise that people are worried about, these moments when the whole image is super bright and that's making the value at that point in the time course totally not representative of the signal in that voxel. Okay, so what you can do about time points like this, if you know where they are, there's a preprocessing is the question of how do you figure out where those time points are, if you have any, right? But let's say you know that there was one point when the whole image went crazy bright, the person sneezed. You want to get that time point out of your data, okay? The best thing you can do, and we can go into what the alternatives are, but I'm just going to tell you the best thing, is you put one regressor in your model, which is an impulse regressor. And what it looks like is this, okay? It's not convolved with an HRF. It's just a single value different from zero, one time point. So the best fit for a regressor that looks like this is to make the size of this purple line exactly the height of this. There's no way to make an impulse fit the data better at one point than to make the height of the line exactly the height of the data because you're only fitting one time point. Is that clear to people? Unlike the HRF where you're trying to fit many time points, 
With an impulse regressor, you're fitting a single time point. And so the, there's no fit better than to make the height of that exactly the height of that time point, and there's no trade-offs because there's nothing else you're trying to do. Is that clear? OK. And so that regressor will have an amplitude exactly corresponding to that single value. OK. In a simultaneous regression, once you fit that, there's no more information from that time point for the pink one to fit. Because all the variance in that time point has been explained by the impulse. And so that leaves the pink regressor to explain what's left in the data. And it goes back to fitting the data really well. Is that clear? OK. So this is one kind of noise correction that you can do in data. Sometimes called artifact regressors. That's one way to think about it where if the form of noise in your data is that there's one time point that's very not representative, then you put an impulse regressor in for that one time point, and it fully explains that time point, which means that the other regressor goes back to explaining the data on either side and is not influenced by that one time point anymore. Very critical that you don't convolve this with an HRF, right? Because the whole point is to have this size of this regressor be perfectly fit to the size of this artifact. And the only way to do that is to use an impulse that's not trying to explain any data except for that one time point. Can you to people why that is? One per time point. Yeah, so if you thought that for some reason you had reason to believe that, this was, that there were like four time points that were noise, then you need four separate regressors, one for each time point that you're trying to explain away. OK, so then the question, these are getting to the pre-processing questions, right? Like, how do you figure out where the artifacts are? How many artifacts could there possibly be? How do you know it's an artifact, right? And that's the whole puzzle of pre-processing. Um, and if you thought you had an answer, then you should try infant data, because all the answers don't work, right? So um, figuring out what an artifact is and how to handle it again in infant data has reposed all these questions. So we're trying to resolve a lot of solved problems for a new situation with infant data. And that raises all these questions. Can a run be all artifact? <laughs> so and then there's limits on the number of regressors you can solve. Yeah. So um, the question of how to decide what is an artifact, how many artifacts you have, how many artifacts is too many? Those questions are questions that you have to solve in pre-processing. They're applied simultaneously, not sequentially. That's right. So you put all the regressors in at the same time. Yeah, good question. So first of all, I don't know that that's standard. Okay. I, we definitely don't do that, um, like explicitly model rest. We don't explicitly model rest. Um, it's also not clear, I mean, at a certain point, you can't have condition regressors that add up to 100%. I guess once they're convolved, they wouldn't. Um, yeah, so I don't know about people explicitly modeling rest. We standardly don't explicitly model rest. But then your second question, which is, if you explicitly model rest, does that set a meaningful range on your beta values? And I don't think that's true either. Um, depending on this, how you scale your other regressors, there can be a natural interpretation of beta values in terms of percent signal change, which some toolboxes offer. They offer to translate your beta values into percent signal change, but then they will have scaling parameters that they set for your nuisance regressors in order to maintain that relationship. So this, is, this will just vary hugely by which analysis package you're using, whether beta values will have a natural scale or not. And basically, so in a two-condition model where they're both one, where the height of the boxcar was one and there's nothing else going on, then there's a translation. But once you have nuisance regressors, it depends on the scale of the nuisance regressors. And, and so is it in millimeters or have you scaled it to one as well and so forth, right? So yeah, so the, there's no simple answer that applies across analysis packages to the scale of a beta value. It will change if you have any parametric regressors. Yeah, so the simple answer is that unless a software package has been designed to do this, there's no translation between beta values and percent signal change that you can rely on. If you want to know the percent signal change, you should calculate it. And then there's a controversy about what's rest for percent signal change. Is it the mean of the run or the resting periods and so forth? So DICOMS is the raw data. 
Yep. Yep. So usually, the steps that you will do in data analysis This also, the names for this and the order depend on packages. So if what I say doesn't fit what you do, just tell me what you do and I'll explain what it means. But the standard thing is, so you get raw data, right, which come from the scanner usually in DICOM format. And then um, you unpack that into some format, nifty or image or whatever. And then the first thing you do is pre-processing, usually, which again, we're not talking about here yet. Preprocessing is a bunch of things you do to your data um, to deal with head motion and various other things. So usually motion correction, normalization, and smoothing. But again, we'll come back to that. So a bunch of things to get your data in some standardized format. Then usually the next step is modeling. And the model is where you combine the data that you measured with what you knew about your experiment and the HRF, and that step produces the beta values. Right? And that's per participant, per experiment, sometimes per run. Right? Your subject was in the scanner. They wa watched the faces and scenes for five minutes. That's a five-minute run of data, 360 images, I think. Seconds. Seconds. So divide that by two. 180. 180 images. So you got 180 volumes of brain in DICOMs. You did some pre processing, which we haven't talked about. Then you said, I had two conditions, faces and scenes. I know when they were. I know the shape of an HRF. Tell me for every voxel how big the response was to faces and how big the response was to scenes. And now you have two beta images. These images then, which is one subject's brain with the beta values for each condition you care about, those then become the substrate for whatever you're going to go on to do next in data analysis. So usually, whatever you're going to do, this is the common language. And then from here, we're going to go in many different directions. 